question, please speak directly into that microphone so that uh, not only can everyone hear you, but so that we can catch you on video recording as well. Uh, please understand that by speaking into the microphone, you are giving the Ford Hall Forum permission to record you. Now, I would like you all to free yourselves from the shackles of your cell phones and press the off button. Uh, I see a few people. Come on, there's more of you. All right, well done. So good evening, one and all, and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm Jennifer Venardi, the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum, where the speakers and the audience get to exercise their freedom of speech. Thank you for joining us tonight at Cutting Edge Corporate Giving. Tonight, we are going to explore why and how charity is good for business, as well as what new methods of corporate philanthropy are helping both companies and nonprofits. Uh, allow me to take this time to thank the, Ford's, uh, the Ford Hall Forum's generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Nellie Mae Educational Foundation, the Barr Foundation, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the forum's home base. We especially thank our season sponsor, the Boston Beer Company, makers of Sam Adams Beer. And now I finally get to tell you what I wish I could have advertised if it were legal. If you haven't heard, the Boston Beer Company has generously offered to sponsor a reception directly following the forum for everyone who has come. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> no, don't you wish to I so wanted to take an ad out in the paper for this. Um, sorry I had to be so quiet about it, but now I can tell you freely, um, beer from Sam Adams, practically next door, don't want to miss it. The second this thing is over at eight o'clock, we're shooting over there. The volunteers will hand hold you and lead you over there. The Beantown Pub is where it's gonna be. It's two doors down and it's in big lights. You can't miss it. Um, so I was wanted to let you know that sparing a minute after the forum for some delicious Sam Adams beer and hors d'oeuvres is exactly the type of philanthropy that we need more of in this town. <laughs> so thank you, Jim, for starting that. Um, the Ford Hall Forum volunteers, as I said, will gladly direct you to the Beantown Pub just two doors down after the forum. And finally, the forum thanks our members uh, whose generosity makes this free public event possible. If you're not a member of the Ford Hall Forum, just go right up to the info table and become one. It is as fun as my face looks. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, George Donnelly. For almost 11 years now, George Donnelly has been the editor of the Boston Business Journal. Prior to his tenure at the Boston Business Journal, he was a senior ed editor at CFO Magazine, where he covered a range of corporate finance topics. In the mid-90s, Donnelly served as editor-in-chief of the TAB Newspaper Group, which included 15 weekly newspapers in the Boston area. He began his career in journalism as a reporter for the Somerville Journal in the 1980s, where he quickly became editor and remained for several years. Uh, Donnelly re received his degree in English literature from Binghamton University. Ladies and gentlemen, George Donnelly. That was interesting to hear that recited. Uh, I've never been more powerful than when I was the editor of the Somerville Journal, by the way. <laughs> 76,000 people uh, back before the internet and you were the only source of news, of local news, so it was quite interesting. A great time. But anyway, great to be with you tonight. Uh, we have for you a terrific panel. You are, if you came here today, you just not knowing what to expect, uh, you are in luck because we have some of the leading thinkers and practitioners around this whole space of corporate philanthropy, corporate giving, citizenship, what it all means. And so I'm uh, really looking forward to getting into a discussion with the panel about what's going on, what's working, what isn't. Um, at the BBJ, the Boston Business Journal, it is an area that we look at very hard. Uh, it's, we consider uh, corporate giving, corporate uh, citizenship to be a fundamental business activity that often defines uh, how a business is perceived and, and often provides a competitive edge in the marketplace. It's something that defines you whether you do it well or you do it poorly. And every year we have a corporate citizenship summit uh, where we rank the top local givers uh, 
in the region and also recognize what we consider to be exemplary partnerships in that space as well. So um, it's, uh, if, you, if you happen to be uh, interested in the topic uh, we have and want to pursue this, we ha our summit, we just had it. We have it early, uh, just after Labor Day every September. But anyway, on to the panel. I have their bios and uh, I'm going to read through their bios and then we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll be off to the races. Um, next to me is Stacy Palmer. She is the editor of the Chronicle of Philanthropy based in Washington, D.C. She has flown up to be with us tonight. She has served as a top editor since the newspaper was founded in 1988 and has overseen the development of its websites. She appears frequently on radio and television shows to offer commentary on news in the nonprofit world. Palmer is also editor of Challenges for Philanthropy and Nonprofits, a book that collects three decades of observations by nonprofit activists. The Chronicle, uh, uh, the Chronicle Philanthropy columnist Pablo Eisenberg. Before she joined the Chronicle of Philanthropy, she was editor for government and politics at the Chronicle of Higher Education. Palmer is a graduate of Brown University where she earned her BA in international relations. Next to her is Jim Cook, in case you didn't know. Anyone who's been watching any baseball lately has seen Jim in this new series of uh, commercials, but Jim, uh, is president of Boston Beer Company, which he founded in 1984. Prior to this, he worked as a business consultant with the Boston Consulting Group for five years, but ultimately gave it up to become a brewer. <laughs> Cook's goal was to bring to America a domestic beer, Samuel Adams, which could compete with imports on taste and quality. I think we all have to agree he has succeeded. <laughs> Cook earned his BA in government from Harvard University and continued on there in a graduate program that earned him a law degree and a master's in business. The Boston Beer Company was proud to win Paul Newman, the Paul Newman Committee to encourage Corporate Philanthropy Award last year in the small business category. And at the far end of the table from me is Dr. Len Schlesinger. He is the 12th president of Babson College and serves on various business-oriented boards and councils. From 1999 through 2007, he held multiple executive positions, including chief operating officer at Limited Brands and at Au Bon Pain. Schlesinger worked for 20 years at Harvard Business School, where he was the George Fisher Baker Jr. Professor of Business Administration, as well as the architect and chair and chair of the MBA Essential Skills and Foundations programs. Following his time at Harvard, Schlesinger was professor of sociology and public policy and senior vice president and counselor to the president at Brown University. Schlesinger holds a doctorate of business administration from Harvard Business School, an MBA from Columbia University, and a BA in American Civilization from Brown University. Welcome, one and all. Thank you for being here, I know. In other words, this is one serious group of people uh, who have a lot to say in this topic. I, where I wanted to get started with the conversation with this is just to frame the area. I, when I'm thinking about the topic, I, and given the breadth of expertise on the panel, I wanted to ask about where we have come in the last 20 years in corporate giving. I want to believe personally that the field has evolved, but the numbers don't necessarily reflect that. The numbers that I, I got from the, uh, the Chronicle of Philanthropy indicated that, at least with the big companies, giving was around 2.5%. 5% of profits about 20 years ago, and now it's down to around 1%. Is that about right, Stacey? Mm -hmm. So are we, are we treading water? What's different in the landscape? And so I thought I'd start with you, uh, Stacey, on that. Um, I think it is very different in terms of the way people think about giving away money, um, and that's both big companies and small companies. Uh, when 
we first started covering the world of corporate philanthropy, people gave to pretty much anything and everything, and you never heard the word strategic. Now you only hear the word strategic. Um, and everybody has different definitions of what that means, um, but people are at least thinking about trying to make a difference and realizing that sort of just giving away money willy-nilly doesn't really necessarily solve many problems. Um, on the other hand, if you're a small struggling nonprofit, you liked the willy-nilly days. Um, and it's been a long time till people could recover other ways of getting money. So um, while if you talk to most people in corporate philanthropy, they're very proud of that strategy, there are some downsides to it in terms of who loses out. Um, and I think there needs to be more conversation about that. But certainly it has evolved in a dramatic way. The recession has absolutely hit corporate giving in a very big way, and so that's why you see the numbers um, not being very big. Um, but it's not just the number of cash, but it's also the services that companies provide in other ways, and people are thinking a lot more about that in different ways, and I hope we can talk about that this evening as well. Sure, Len, uh, 20 years ago, 1991, 2011? Well, I think I agree with Stacy that the world has changed dramatically in a variety of different ways. Um, the place that actually hasn't experienced the most fundamental change, quite honestly, is the large not-for-profits. Uh, there's been huge disruption in the corporate community when you look at the dislocation of large organizations, the disruption, the, the M&A out of business, the, uh, the entrepreneurs who are taking organizations on. Um, if I look at uh, over the 20 years, if I look at the, uh, the Fortune 25, uh, and I look at them today, um, probably 18 of the 25 are gone. Uh, if I look at the top 25 not-for-profit organizations 25 years ago or 20 years ago, and I look at them today, it's the same list. No. The reality is the large ones have continued to be large. Uh, it has created, obviously, uh, enormous issues with the ability of, uh, of new and innovative and potentially disruptive not-for-profits to be able to get attention and to get any sort of scale. While all of that is going on, uh, there's been an equivalent set of activities on the corporate side. As corporations are experiencing enormous sets of profit pressures uh, and employment pressures, uh, the only way which we've gotten attention to corporations for the philanthropic agenda has been uh, by putting the word strategic in front of it. Um, I actually discovered that uh, when I was a Harvard Business School professor, if you put the word strategic in front of something, you could charge twice as much. <laughs> uh, and, and so as a consequence, we're now in the business of strategic corporate philanthropy. I don't quite know what that is or what that means. Uh, and so I want to be reasonably precise uh, about it, which is, do we have more companies giving more money to more not-for-profits? The answer is no. Okay? Uh, and I think they would argue, uh, uh, as you hear time and time again, uh, that the first and foremost agenda is the preservation of the enterprise. Uh, and to the extent that giving money and time away interferes with the preservation of the enterprise, um, that's not a good thing. Uh, and so as a result, we continue to have this tension that's driven by the articulation of philanthropy as essentially a trade-off with a business agenda. Uh, and until such times we move beyond the word strategic into actually figuring out what the nature of that business agenda really is uh, and how you find corporations acting on that agenda, I'm not very optimistic about substantive change. Now, the reality is there are a number uh, of leading lights playing out in that space. Jim is among them, and I'm sure he'll tell you about that uh, either here or at the bar. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there are a number of leading lights. The question is how those leading lights who are really figuring out both strategic ways to go forward and systemic ways to intervene Okay, as a, as a as a corporation uh, in the not-for-profit philanthropic arena, um, uh, and we actually get attention uh, of uh, general managers, not attention of CSR folks. Uh, I'm not going to be all that optimistic. Riddle me this then. Oops, sorry. Um, it seems to be at least truly Massachusetts that the in, the ecosystem of nonprofits continues to proliferate and that uh, we just have a little factoid in our current issue that in 2000 there were around 30,000 nonprofits and uh, in 2010 about 38,000, that's roughly 25%. Um, how given the decline in giving do we have this proliferation and, and do you really blame a general manager or 
business for being very confused, if not exhausted, by the options that are out there. I'll, just quickly, because you know my point of view, but I'll just lay it out here just for entertainment value. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are far too many not-for-profit organizations chasing far too few dollars. Uh, and there are far too many not-for-profit organizations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with overlapping agendas uh, that, by definition, reduces the aggregate level of effectiveness of the not-for-profit community in town. So uh, there, is no, uh, there is no effective M&A market for not-for-profits, uh, although that would be a huge advance if the finance community began to shift their attention into that agenda. Um, but but the, there is no surprise that uh, corporations are confused. Uh, there's no surprise that the proliferation of those organizations leads to a non-strategic approach uh, to philanthropy on both sides of the agenda. Hmm. So it seems like, though, Len, what you're talking about is this a, a, a very um, embedded sense of alignment uh, and where, where corporate giving is intimately tied to uh, the business mission of the enterprise. Let's switch over to, to Jim Cook for a second here and, um, and talk, and let's, let's run us through, Jim, your thinking. And as you um, look at the environment, you must, um, you, uh, your face is everywhere. You're, um, you, bring beer, thought. You, you bring beer to lectures. Um, <laughs> seem like a very approachable person. You must get approached a lot. And uh, how have you worked through where you give and why, first of all? And then let's, well, let's talk about how you uh, have been trying to find that alignment that Len talks about. OK. Um, I mean, we've gone through an evolution, because uh, obviously, Sam Adams started very small. I, mean, I was literally making beer in my kitchen 27 years ago. So uh, we've grown from you know infinitesimal. Today we've become a small brewer, and uh, maybe someday we'll get to tiny. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it's um, you know we've always had some, or I've always had maybe some sense that we need and can benefit from. Uh, Involvement with the community uh, that you know supports us, buys our beer, etc. And I and, and maybe I have a little different perspective on this because my family's always been brewers, so I'm in a business that at one time lost its connection with its community, uh, and that resulted in the termination of our ability as brewers to even make beer. I mean, it was called prohibition, but uh, and it was uh, this America's nightmare and hangover. But for 14 years, people in my line of work were uh, prohibited from practicing their craft because uh, you know the the community that we existed in decided that we did not add value, and that's a very I hate to say. Sobering, but it's a <laughs> sobering thought. In the in my line of work, we the, the ability to just even exist is not a permanent right. So, uh, and uh, we've had an approach to you know I guess you'd call it philanthropy, though it uh, sounds like a big word of of trying to be involved in our community and give back. And I have had. Uh, to me, as a company, it's a cop-out to write a check to uh, a charity. It's just, um, and that's maybe the old style giving from 30 years ago where that was sprayed around. And to me, that's almost corporate irresponsibility because, um, you know, first of all, you're just moving money from one pocket to another. Second of all, it's not my money. It's a shareholder's money. And they may, if they want to give money away, they're entitled to do it. But I'm not sure how legitimate it is for me to claim the right to do that on their behalf uh, and without their uh, approval. Now, and, and third, I'm a business. Um, I'm an, an entrepreneur, and so I view my role is to add value. A business, 
you know, adds value. We take barley and we take hops and we take bottles and we take bottle and we, you know, they're worth this much and then we make them into Sam Adams and they're worth that much. And that's, to me, the essence of what a business does is it adds value and that, I guess that's the strategic word with philanthropy. So we've always tried to do uh, our, you know, our uh, philanthropy in a way that added a lot of value. And I, I guess it started with, uh, you know, we are, and, and added value both to the business and to the community. And so I started my brewery in uh, a location in Jamaica Plain. This was 1984. Uh, it's was an old brewery, for those of you who remember Haffenreffer, it was a Haffenreffer brewery, mm -hmm. uh, and it had been abandoned. It's five acres in the middle of our community. It was an eyesore. Uh, the other tenants were, let's see, Pablo the pornographic painter, uh, <laughs> Dick the psycho squatter who killed cats and staked them out on plywood to decorate uh, his space, um, and us. <laughs> and we have been there for 27 years as a tenant. Um, we are not, we don't own the space. Our landlord is the neighborhood. Our landlord is, we got together with our neighborhood, formed a community-based nonprofit, Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Development Corporation. Long story short, 27 years later, the space is fully tenanted. It's the home to uh, about 35 small community-based businesses, many of them in food and beverage, like us. It was actually the incubator for, if you've ever seen Stacy's potato chips, Stacy started there. Stacy Madison, she was our neighbor about 20 years ago. Um, Maria and Ricardo's tacos were right across from us. And to me, that's, you know, that doesn't show up as philanthropy in any way, but it's part of a greater mission for a business to add value to its community. And you know, I, so I, I can talk about what we're doing now, but that's, I've talked enough, and we probably have some other questions, but I can get to that later. Well, I think, the, I think it would be helpful for the audience to hear, given that mindset, you did create a, a, a very concrete program around three or so years ago. Uh, and again, getting into the mindset of the business owner, the decision maker at the corporation, at the business, sifting through all these options, how did you come across this program, the Brewing American Dream, Brewing the American Dream program? Um, it was, was, were there starts and stops? And uh, it just, just help us understand how that came to be. Um, well, the, the sort of the catalyst, the epiphany, um, remember it was in South Boston, we'd had one of these, uh, Typical, you know, corporate uh, community, corporate community involvement day, where we got uh, a whole bunch of people, maybe 30 of us, and we went out and we spent a day uh, painting a community center in South Boston. And you know, everybody worked very hard. It was sort of a nice feel-good thing for everybody in the company that we had done this good work. And so everybody was gone, and I was. You know, going back to my car and uh, just standing on the sidewalk thinking, I don't really feel that great about what we just did. Uh, because, you know, maybe we did, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand dollars worth of painting. And I had my CFO, I had, you know, half of the management team, and all these, but I probably wasted about three thousand dollars worth of company time to create a thousand dollars worth of value because we spent the day pretending we know how to paint. Uh, <laughs> and I don't feel that great about it. I mean, everybody else is feeling really good that we did this, you know, and some people from the community and some nuns and they all came and thanked us. And so it was, every, but I didn't feel good about it because I had not done what I'm supposed to do as a business, which is create value. So uh, that was the beginning of, uh, I. Uh, if we're going to be involved with our community, which we want to do, and I, this goes, the, the thought that is maybe behind all of this goes back to actually an article that I wrote in 
seven in uh, the Environmental Law Review at Harvard. And it was the the uh, the point of it was it was we looked at a whole bunch of annual reports for companies, and basically what you discovered is that community. This was in 1976 annual reports. Companies that talked about their social responsibility uh, in a meaningful way actually correlated with higher profitability of the long run financial metrics. So, and my uh, belief is that companies that are more involved with their community, more attuned to their role in their society are actually probably better companies at tracking how the market is going, how their employees' attitudes are changing. They're just more in touch with their environment and that makes them better, more profitable companies. So that is the sort of the philosophical underpinning of this desire to really be uh, involved with the rest of our environment in a, in, in a different way than just extracting profit from it. So um, we thought about, okay, what are our strengths? We're entrepreneurial, we wanna add value, um, we're young, we know food and beverage, hospitality, um, and out of that came a program that we call Brewing the American Dream. And it, it's basically two components. One of them is micro lending to small businesses because we're a small business and that's what we know. Uh, and we bootstrapped from nothing to where we are today. We know that journey. Um, and we know food and beverage. Uh, so it's micro lending in food, beverage, and hospitality. It began in just New England. Uh, and the other component was coaching, counseling, uh, and mentoring of small businesses. So the, basically a program that gives loans to uh, small businesses and provides coaching, counseling, and mentoring with them. And the coaching uh, and counseling is done with people in, in our company. Uh, the, the technique with it we uh, developed is we call it speed coaching. It's like speed dating. So we have it at the brewery. It's pretty easy to get people come to a brewery with all the free beer. Um, and a bunch of our neighbors provide food. Uh, and uh, entrepreneurs, small business people, uh, primarily, and some people start up will come uh, to the brewery and they will sign up for 20 minute sessions with people at Boston Beer Company who have expertise in uh, the kind of areas that are of interest to uh, the businesses that we're working with. So it, it ranges from, you know, there'll be uh, a real estate person who can help them to, you know, if you have, uh, you're trying to sign a lease and you want to know how to deal with that. So it would be like, ranging from a real estate person to package design to uh, somebody who's good at procuring exotic ingredients from all over the world. Uh, to somebody, uh, Sally, who uh, has been in PR for 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. The kinds of uh, issues that a small business has. Because a, a small business, you know, what you discover is they know a lot about something. And they're very passionate about coffee or cookies or uh, sake or, you know, all these are sausages or all these different things. but you know, you have a small business and you're, uh, you know, you have to be the CFO, the CMO, the CIO, the, all this C stuff. You have to do that and you don't really know what you're doing. And 20 minutes of advice from somebody who's been there and done that it, against the specific problem that you're struggling with can add a whole lot of value. So that's basically can I, the program. Can I yeah. push back? I, I want to push back on your self-definition, because I think your self-definition as an entrepreneur who's trying to create value for an investor co flies completely at odds with the characterization of the two things that you're talking about that you're doing. So, so I you- I didn't say create value for an investor. We said we have investors. We have, we have, we have- said I don't necessarily need to give away their money. Ah, but Our okay. mission is not, and under Massachusetts law, I am not required to run the business for the best interests of the, of the owner. That's an important point. Right. Okay. In, and, and what I want to deal with that is both in the short run and the long run. Because in the short run, you could have made a series of decisions as a lessee of a space in Jamaica Plain to find the cheapest available space 
uh, and continue to optimize your lowest, uh, your lowest lease cost over time, which by definition most certainly would have had you out of Jamaica Plain tw within the 27 year time frame. Okay? No question at all, but you elected to actually uh, instigate a community co-op to be able to create a, li a living, thriving space out of what otherwise would have been a low cost lessee, okay? right. uh, and you've transformed a community. Now, um, that's exactly what I mean by systemic philanthropy, which is the ability to use your existence as an enterprise to engage other people in systematic activity that transforms a system. Okay? And when we talk about the highest form of corporate philanthropy, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The second piece you talked about is this issue of you're know, the first person who's actually acknowledged that the end of painting day you don't feel good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because we're all supposed to feel good. I don't paint in my house. Uh, my wife doesn't invite me to do anything remotely mechanical. Okay? Why would I expect the existence of my time and presence in a mechanically oriented project in the community somehow adds value? Uh, and, it, and you said, you know, I, I put 3,000 hours of managerial manpower up against a $2,000 painting job. I should have just hired a painter uh, and gone back and earned money, more money to do it. That's exactly the problem we're talking about. There's a lot of feel-good stuff that has no metrics and no measurement uh, that has very little in the form of accountability. And I'm not discounting the fact that some of those po folks felt good, okay? The question is, can you create a scenario where you can feel good and do something that is lasting and meaningful and sustainable? And the evolution of the work in philanthropy has got to be entirely in that direction. I don't want to talk about strategic philanthropy. I want to talk about strategy okay, that includes engagement with the communities that you're a part of as a central part of the business model. And I think that's what you're talking about. And I would say not to mention the fact that the nonprofit had to organize all those people to come and paint, and they may not have needed you to paint. What they really needed was your management skills, the computers, the marketing, the same thing that you give to small businesses. That's what they need. Um, and one of the interesting things that you may know about that Walmart's doing um, is they're giving logistical help to food banks and doing all kinds of things to really make the process of food delivery a lot smarter. And you can question all the things you want about Walmart and what its motives are, but what they're doing is actually adding value that the food banks really need these days. Um, they could use some cash and they're giving them some of that, but what they said was, you know, it's really more important. We know how to get food so that it is delivered as fast as possible while it's fresh and we can actually get it to people and not have it be wasted. And so that's one of the things that they're giving that skill. If more thinking like that would go on, um, I think the employees and everybody involved in it would be more engaged and more excited and we'd also do a lot more good. Isn't it hard though to do that? It, is, th is that in a broad based way just too much to expect from the vast majority of businesses? that may otherwise just want to be engaged in one form or another? Because maybe, maybe the metrics we don't have are what's the core engagement level for certain enterprises of certain sizes of any kind of engagement. So I'm, I, I'm just, as devil advocate, yeah. the, the, the kinds, of, kinds of things that Jim has done and the kinds of things that we at the PBJ hold up as examples are, are wonderful. The question is, isn't that a very difficult process to get to? And, how, and how do you, so how do you get to that alignment then? Is, is, is there, what, what's the, what are the keys? Because, because otherwise we're gonna have a lot of bad painting on buildings. I mean, you know, when I think about this stuff, I, uh, I mean, I think about it very selfishly. I, you know, when we were working out this program, one of my questions was always, well, what's in it? for the company, because if it's a win for the company, as well as a win for the community, we can do a lot of it. If it's a win for the community, but it's a net loss for the company, we're gonna limit it. Yeah. So to me, you know, again, as an entrepreneur, as a business person focused on adding value, it's, you have to, you know, design uh, this program like you would design, a, you know, a startup business that, that uh, is a win for the customer and a win for the company when you're designing your product. Same thing's true here. And for us, I mean, I, uh, one of the wonderful things about the program is it keeps our employees in touch with 
the spirit of entrepreneurship with what a small business is all about. Because as we grow, it's harder for us to keep new people in contact with uh, the, you know, our entrepreneurial roots. And we're in a business where Sam has been reasonably successful. Anybody know what our market share in the U.S. beer business is? 27 years of, of very successful growth. How much? Yeah, it's less than 1%. So we're, we are inherently a small company, and no matter what I do, I mean, even if I'm wildly successful and we double, we're going to get to two. You know, <laughs> <laughs> big deal. Uh, and so this program is, for us, really benefits us. When we go down there and, and coach those people, it makes our people think about our business differently. So I believe mm -hmm. that we get real value out of this that is at least equal to the time and the money that we put into it. And that's what we need. Len, would you agree that then the test for the most meaningful philanthropy is that if you pull it away, you start, you're pulling away part of the soul of an enterprise? Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, it, it, somewhat critically, it, it, when, when I listen to these conversations, particularly around the, the classical uh, argument that large organizations serve to satisfy shareholders and the business of business is taking care of shareholders, the reality is that's essentially, okay, and I'll, I'll make the political statement and then we can decide whether I can provide empirical support to be able to support it, um, that, that much of Western capitalism has failed miserably in being able to attend to the second order and third order effects of the work they've done at the single-minded pursuit of profits without any consideration of the environment and the people that are part of it. And the reality is when you look at the history of philanthropy and corporate philanthropy, some of the greatest philanthropists that we celebrate today are individuals who are not all that great as business people who assuage their guilt associated with the second and third order consequences by deciding they would create a foundation and give money away. I believe at the core that, that can be demonstrated to be uh, economically inefficient. Okay? And part of the argument I have and I get to, get to play with as the president of a, a college that focuses on business and entrepreneurship uh, we engaged uh, early on in the process of the faculty really debating that fundamental question. And so we're one of the few schools uh, in the United States that have signed the UN Principles for Responsible Management Education that it does in fact articulate the need to create a logic uh, associated with outcomes just like the logic Jim talked about here. A logic that says you can in fact, okay, you can in fact create a business strategy that focuses on achieving multiple outcomes that does attend to issues of people, that does attend to issues of planet, that does attend to issues of profits. And there are many more opportunities for commonalities of purpose and approach before you get to the trade-offs. Uh, and so what we're really looking for is a set of intentional managerial logics and behaviors that are looking for those points of intersection before you talk about the trade-offs. And, uh, and you can call me either optimistic or blissfully naive, uh, but I do believe there's a portfolio of businesses just like Jim's that are demonstrating day in and day out that there is a management model that is systematically able to attend to all of those variables simultaneously, not perfectly, but simultaneously, that are creating value in new and different ways. Whether it's Jim on the brewing side or John Mackey on the Whole Food side, really systematically attending to the broader health issues that exist in the United States and being very clear about that for the associates that work in the firm, for the customers that buy from the firm, and the communities that they're part of. Or even, quite honestly, for a set of experiences we have at Babson. And again, it's a little bit like your comments about Walmart. I'm not talking about Goldman Sachs per se, but I will talk about the intentional dimensions of Goldman Sachs corporate philanthropy that wildly exceed the, the capabilities and the work of the vast majority of institutions that I've ever seen in the world, let alone locally. Uh, we're connected up to two initiatives with Goldman Sachs. One, 10,000 women, which is explicitly recognizing um, a reality that women represent over 50% of the population of the world uh, and the environments in the world where women don't represent a sizable part of the economic activity of those environments are significantly less advanced societies in so many different ways, not the least of which is economic development. If I'm an investment bank, I am interested in stimulating economic development, and it became very clear for Goldman Sachs that there was a huge opportunity 
to engage in a long-term business issue related to the growth of global economies by investing a sizable amount of money and being able to stimulate women's economic development in emerging economies where they traditionally did not play a central role. This was not another, quote, startup program. These were people who were running businesses that were going to get, in this case, the equivalent of $100 million of education and support, much like his speed dating, um, that was designed to assist these women uh, in the process of building more substantive, more stable, more lasting businesses, and also create more jobs in those environments. Um, so what you end up having is $100 million of philanthropy uh, that has a huge opportunity to impact a corporate agenda. We come to the United States where the issues of women's representation in economic affairs is strikingly different than it is in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and uh, the issue became much more of the explicit recognition of the need for jobs. Uh, there had been a little bit of discussion about that recently in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and the recognition of the opportunity to stimulate job creation in urban distressed areas by investing in small business people who heretofore have suffered from three things. They've suffered from a lack of access to basic education uh, and the ability to develop growth plans. They suffer from a lack of mentorship uh, and they suffer from uh, uh, no access to capital. Uh, and so here in the United States, they've made uh, a $500 million commitment to provide $200 million of education, $300 million of lending capital to be distributed across urban distressed areas through uh, community development finance institutions, and a population of Goldman Sachs people who instead of going out and painting, okay, uh, are providing mentorship and support to these small business folks who really are dealing with fundamental issues of growth. For me, those are the kinds of activities like your Jamaica Plain activity, where a corporation has figured out what its agenda and purpose is and has actually developed uh, a way of systemically engaging with a broad array of communities uh, and with philanthropic support to make a much larger difference in the world. And there is no question that that calls for skills that by and large the corporate philanthropy departments in most organizations haven't played out. Hmm. It still raises the issue though of outcomes. Uh, the, even, the, even the most ambitious, well thought out, integrated philanthropic programs, citizenship programs, need to be measured in some form or fashion? Does, does the panel agree or disagree? And so how should they be measured then? Jim, how do you measure yours? Um, with the Bring the American Dream program, we're, we measure it in terms of, of jobs created and the repayment rate of the loans. Because uh, frankly, we're not trying to lend money to people who are going to fail and not repay the loans. We're trying to lend money to people who can take a loan, uh, use it to grow their business, create jobs, and pay it back. And we get a 92% repayment rate on the loans, which is, the, to me, extraordinarily high, though if you're a bank and you, you, know, you, you lose 8% of your loan, you might have a problem. You got problems, but for us, that means every dollar that we put in there gets recycled nine times. Stacey, what about the measurement issue, the metrics issue? Um, it's a huge one playing out in the philanthropy world. Everybody wants to measure everything um, to the point of what some people call measurement mania now. Um, and it's very hard when you're trying to solve the kind of social problems that many nonprofits are trying to solve to say that you know in one quarter you're going to achieve this kind of results. Um, so you know what's important, I think, for many nonprofits is to find a realistic way to measure the kinds of things that really do show progress and show that you're paying attention to what's going on and actually trying to solve some of these problems. So making sure that all kinds of donors think hard about what is appropriate rather than just bringing a corporate mindset to it, it it's not the same thing. And you wouldn't want it to be the same thing, that there's a whole different way to do it. Um, but clearly, you know, it's got to have benefit for the company. I don't think any nonprofit even would argue that, there, you know, yes, you want to give to the community, but the whole point of doing it is it's different than an individual deciding to give some of your own money. It's a, it's a hugely different decision. That's what the corporate owner can decide to do with his or her own money. Um, and I think people sometimes met, don't distinguish that quite as much. They think of companies as people, and, and they're different. Except for the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs>
And Mitt Romney. <laughs> Len, the model you were talking about, this again, this broader outcomes model, it, it seems like there's some risk there, that being kind of squishy, fuzzy. No, not at all. Uh, actually, just, just the opposite. The reality is when you're making large-scale bets that are linked to the enterprise, you can actually spend more money on measurement. Uh, the problem with measurement mania that Stacy's talking about before is if you're diffusing a limited resource base across a portfolio of a broad number of not-for-profits and you expect to be able to measure outcomes, you're going to spend more money on good measurement than you're going to spend on intervention. And that's the nature of the problem we're talking about. If you're going to make reasonably big bets, then you better be able to articulate a logic for measurement and impact uh, that is linked to the nature of the bets and the resources that you're expending just the same way you would expect a return on investment analysis from any concrete business objective. And I think the programs that we're talking about <coughs> have been very good, quite honestly, of hiring, you know, we're a contractor developing education. We're not allowed to be involved in the research, okay? Uh, that they've hired an independent third party uh, that is doing, uh, that's doing serious research. Now, the interesting issue is when someone comes to me and says, well, you know, is it double-blind placebo control? <laughs> and I said, no, because we're not doing science, okay? Uh, and uh, the issue is to understand that we need to measure, we need to manage the measurement modality to the nature of the intervention uh, and to recognize that there's got to be a balance. But but there is no question that you can develop rigorous measurement that isn't remotely squishy okay, uh, around the things that you're trying to do if you're clear about what you're trying to do. Okay? So you have to start with a reasonable hypothesis about what it is you're trying to achieve. So the question isn't about measurement about philanthropy. The question is, can you articulate a set of outcomes that you're desiring and can you measure performance against that? George? Yes. It's, it's just me. It's not an angel. Um, could, would you like to take questions? Yes, I was just about to turn to the audience. And um, <laughs> thank you so much for reminding me. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, this panel is eager to hear your questions. It, that would probably be helpful, sure. Dr. Peter Hill of my chiropractor, so I know very little about philanthropy. And uh, about a year ago, I became, I was volunteered, they sort of volunteered me to become the media spokesperson for the Fatherhood Coalition, which is basically a 501c3 with absolutely no money. And um, so my question to you is, I've been doing all this volunteer work, like meeting with the commissioner of uh, like uh, Department of Revenue, probation, registry of motor vehicles, I'm doing all this work for no money. And I have a goal to expand the organization. I'd like to get them to have advocacy, legal advocacy, housing for fathers who are just getting separated and divorced and don't know what to do, just a lot of stuff. How do I help them grow the organization, get money, get them started, and try to help fathers who are struggling through separation and divorce and give them help? <laughs> I didn't say it was an easy question. Yeah, yeah. I, and they drink beer probably, too. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'm no expert in philanthropic fundraising. So I, if I were in your position, I guess I'd try to think about, you know, who could benefit from involvement with the people we're trying to help, you know, what businesses out there uh, that, you know, would care about this, people in this situation. You know, wh who would win? Was it, you know, this has to be a win-win. What businesses would win from uh, supporting this group of people. And it's not an easy thing. It's all, it is as rigorous as starting up a small business, figuring out how to, you've got a product and you've got to find somebody that will benefit from it. And, and, and I just got to echo on it. I mean, it, what you're not going to get there is by doing any more planning. Okay? It's just not going to work. I mean, so the reality is, uh, and I tend to advise all of the not for profits that engage with me on these questions to say just, just for the sake of, uh, of discussion, let's just assume you're a for-profit, okay? And so kind of working off of that, uh, the issue is uh, where is there a customer who's willing to give you money for what it is you do, okay? Uh, and, because uh, right now you say you're working very hard and you have no money. So 
the good news is if you find one other person as committed as you, you can double the size and impact of the organization and still have no money, okay? Um, uh, we, so you already have it. So the, the, the obviously, the obviously the issue is at some point in the process, you're going to have to conclude that you're going to be a small enterprise with a collection of dedicated people uh, who have no financial resources to do your work, but you will really love what you do and you will care deeply about it. Uh, or you're going to have to engage in a systematic process of bringing other people to the table who have resources who are likely to reshape the structure and direction of your enterprise because if it was spot on, you'd probably have people today who are willing to give you money. So it is no different than any other entrepreneurial dilemma, which is, which is if you continuously go out there and you actually don't find anybody who's willing to buy what you have, it either means that you are passionate, passionately associated with a, not a very good idea, Okay. Uh, uh, or, uh, or it might be a good idea, but not one that's going to uh, get any size and scale, which doesn't mean it's bad, okay? Because, see, I keep sitting in these philanthropy uh, conferences, and, and, uh, and uh, they talk about new ideas and all this stuff, and, and the standard litany of the experts who come in saying, you know what, we don't have an innovation problem, we have a scale problem, that none of these things can scale. Well, the fact is when you've got 38,000 not-for-profits, okay, there's a whole bunch of institutional structure that says that scale apparently isn't very important because otherwise why would you keep hiving off smaller and smaller entities to tackle smaller and smaller issues in smaller and smaller communities if you cared about having scale and impact. So there's got to be room for both. Uh, and so I would ask you seriously about, you know, why do you feel a need to grow? And I don't want an answer now, okay? But, uh, and are you willing to make some of the sacrifices associated with what it is you're doing now that you're feeling apparently quite passionate about without any money um, uh, to, to be able to change the nature of what you do? I would also add one factual point just to the context of this conversation, which while corporate philanthropy is hugely important, it's a tiny portion of all giving in the United States, um, seven or eight percent. So really where you need to look for is the individuals. Those are the people who have the money. So you can spend a lot of time chasing corporate money, and it's great to do it, but don't concentrate there. Concentrate on the individuals who have the money and can give it more freely. That's where there's a lot. That's not easy to do either, um, but there are a lot of people who can do research to help you find people who have perhaps had some of these problems in the past are now successful and wealthy and can help you get the word out. You only need a few of those to be able to really get yourself going. The, you are really lucky in this town to have a wonderful community foundation that has terrific resources and that can give advice and has been thinking about a lot of these issues for a long time. And in part, you don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel. You want to know what's already been done. So I would absolutely reach out to them. Mm -hmm. You also, <coughs> excuse me, you also cross, you subscribe to the Boston Business Journal <laughs> and, and cross-reference our CEO list with you know, any activity you might see in family court. <laughs> just, just off the top of my head, sorry. Why are you giving away fundraising secrets? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Someone was served. Um, more questions? Sir. We all just see you here. So, uh, sir, sir, could you approach the microphone? Sure. So, yeah, can yeah, be, so you can be recorded. You know, I've never been accused of having to quiet the voice of a microphone. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, hi, I'm Stas Gage, and I run a nonprofit called Space with a Soul that is a center for other small nonprofits, and we host them. And um, I'm actually asking this question on behalf of a friend who's a development director at a small nonprofit um, who was curious about this. Um, when organizations are new, and so I sympathize with this question, um, how do they approach um, corporations about philanthropy? Because it seems that most corporations have a very Define focus, and so how do you break into something new without having a personal relationship with somebody on the board who says, "Oh, I like you. I'll just make sure the corporation gives you money." And I say that in recognition of what you had previously said about 92% of the money coming from individuals and not corporations. Um, but uh, for corporate giving, 
and corporate partnerships, especially um, new ventures. How do new ventures get connected to corporate philanthropy? I'll build on Stacy's comment and, and, and try to come back. And it, and, it, and it goes back the same way the traditional for-profit entrepreneurial enterprises get uh, uh, get funded and get started. They don't get started with corporate hookups. They get started with MasterCard, Visa, friends, and family. Uh, and, uh, and almost 90% of them uh, are funded in that way. Um, so unless, unless you have a deep and abiding personal relationship or photos with a corporate executive, <laughs> um, uh, my expectation is that you're going to be much better off, uh, much better off realizing that your startup is largely going to be connected to friends and, uh, and people, who, uh, people who care deeply about the idea. And you've got to achieve some sort of size and some sort of repute uh, before you're going to actually effectively be on the radar screen of, uh, of any um, corporate organization's philanthropy. other side of it, we get, I don't know, one or two calls a day. I mean, we just say no, period. Uh, well, actually, we don't say no. We say we'd be happy to give you beer for your event. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, come to the brewery. So um, that, we, that we do uh, much more easily. But as a practical matter, you know, as a little company, you just, you can't screen them. You don't, you just end up saying, you just have a policy. No, we'll give you beer for your event, but we have our own. We're focused on, you know, what we're doing with our brewing the American dream, and we're very pleased with that. So, I think Lynn's right. Unless you've got a, a deep personal relationship or some other way in, it's just not going to happen because everybody's besieged. More questions. <laughs> Generally, one beer per person at the event tends to be about how it works out, because <laughs> some people drink more and some demented individuals drink none. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? I have a question on uh, the role of universities in academia. Um, in light of the financial crisis caused by many different factors, um, potentially greed being one of them. Um, how can universities, and what is the responsibility of universities in shaping you know, the leaders of the future to think more philanthropic, think more about the community for the businesses that they're gonna be inventing uh, to increase the number of 2.5% that's given back uh, to be something that's more substantial? Um, for me, it's easy, and, and so, but I'll speak about it personally rather than speak for higher education in general because I'm not convinced that I'm very good at speaking for higher education in general. Um, uh, I believe as a business school that you actually have the opportunity to have a very clear point of view about the characteristics and dimensions uh, of the kinds of organizations that you'd like to populate the world. Um, and so on your first issue, you know, when you talk about the, the underlying foundations of the, the economic crisis, there are just basically kind of two scenarios that play out all the time, which is, you know, was it greed or was it stupidity? Um, and the reality is why be forced to choose, okay? <laughs> it, 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 it clearly was some part of both. Uh, the, the, what's clear is what got us into this mess isn't going to get us out of the mess in exactly the same way. And so we do have an opportunity, uh, as, and I think our vehicle at Batson is the Principles for Responsible Management Education. We do have a responsibility to be very, very clear uh, about the nature of the outcomes that we, uh, we seek to achieve uh, in modern enterprise. And we have, as uh, academics, a responsibility to be able to demonstrate empirically whether or not uh, those things are in fact true. Uh, but there is nothing uh, uh, about uh, an academic environment that precludes us uh, having an opinion. I, I laughed when I listened to the introduction of the Ford Hall Forum today because they said, you know, it was one of the few places that could provide complete freedom of expression. Okay? Um, I live in an environment where people get lifetime employment and can say whatever the hell they want. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, presidents can't, okay, but, but, uh, but certainly tenured faculty can. Uh, and so, uh, so the notion that you can gain alignment among a population of people that actually have absolute 
freedom of expression as a core professional right um, uh, is a large part of what my job is. Uh, and then to translate it into, uh, into real models of real enterprises uh, and to train people not only to take different roles in existing enterprises, but quite honestly because we're committed uh, to entrepreneurship at the core, to create new and different kinds of enterprises that exemplify the best characteristics of what it is we're talking about. So in that space, I could not be more optimistic uh, about what I experience with uh, the young people uh, at a place like Babson in terms of uh, the sets of values they bring to the table. Uh, most of them are very clear that whatever model, okay, whatever model was taught to their parents and whatever model was followed by their parents has screwed them. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the fact that we have the first generation in the United States that can absolutely, clearly, not look forward to a life as good as the parents, okay, that gave birth to them, uh, gives them ample evidence to be naturally suspicious of those existing models. So we have a very ready uh, and very uh, engaged audience that wants to explore different ways to build enterprises. It's just, it's, it's just a great place to be and a great place to play. And business schools are responding very much so to that demand. There are more and more philanthropy courses being offered by business schools and other places, and largely by, driven by student demand. Um, but also, the you know, nonprofit leaders themselves need to be better educated to under you know. There's you don't grow up and say I want to run a nonprofit. Really, there's not you don't go to school to do that specifically. But now there are places where you can, um, and there's a new generation that is doing that and and, and mixing with the people who are going to run businesses. So I think that's going to create a different dialogue and environment. And for most businesses, those people that you're talking about, Len, are going to be our customers. I mean, and we will succeed or fail by our ability to bond with them and for them to feel comfortable not only with, you know, our specific product, but the company behind it. I mean, I, you're right. I have that. It's, it's in our customers because craft beer drinkers tend to be a bit younger, and it's in our employees. And if we don't engage our customers and employees, these shareholders are screwed. So <laughs> we're going to take care of our customers and our employees. Or the shareholders. Even if you things. choose to take care of your shareholders. If you want to take care of your shareholders, you do it by taking care of your customers and your employees first. And the shareholders are going to be just fine. More questions, sir? Throwing caution to the wind, I'm going to be the second person to hit on Boston Bear and Jim, Jim Cook. Um, <laughs> My name is Jeff Stone. I'm the coordinator of a community engagement uh, three-year grant in Mattapan. It's part of uh, Boston List Resilient Communities effort, and uh, it's, uh, the, there are also three or four foundations and about four banks that have uh, co-funded this. But that's just for the community organizing process. Three neighborhoods got these grants in addition to Mattapan. And one of the thing that it, things that is emerging through our intensive community engagement, we're having in-depth conversations with hundreds of residents and other stakeholders, is uh, the need for some better restaurants in Mattapan. Mattapan Square it really needs redevelopment in many ways, including sit-down restaurants with good service and alcoholic beverages. So we might talk to you about some mentoring and ideas about that. But my question is, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Cook, that um, the local community is uh, your investment of time and uh, your uh, staff's involvement in local community uh, brings payoffs in, their, in terms of their understanding the community and, and thinking differently. How far flung geographically are the projects for the Brewing the American Dream uh, program? Are they all over the country or just Boston or just Jamaica Plain? Um, uh, neither. It's... Uh, it, it, for this to work, we have to have people on the ground there. So we can only do, we can do New England, because we can take a group of people to Hartford or Providence or Portland or Springfield. Um, that's not Mattapan good. is in New England, so. No, I know. <laughs> Mattapan is definitely uh, a place where we would like to find businesses. And one of the uh, sort of unexpected, maybe surprising aspects of this program is we have more money to lend than qualified applicants. 
So uh, part of uh, our effort is to get the word out. And uh, you know, so if you have businesses there, the, the, the pr we've done uh, several businesses that are, uh, you know, it's a small, it's a, often immigrants, they start a little restaurant, um, it's often mostly takeout and there's a counter and we'll lend them 10 grand uh, for them to acquire the space next door and have a sit down environment. I think we've made three of those loans uh, in the last two years. And so that's in our sweet spot. That's exactly the kind of thing that uh, you know, has been successful for us because they're really hard working people. You run a little restaurant, you work your ass off. And those people, uh, if you give them money and can double their, their business uh, without having to double the kitchen and so forth, that it's, it's very profitable and, and we get paid back. So go to the Sam Adams website, look for the Brewing the American Dream tab and we would love to have people like that in Mattapan apply. That would be great. One second, sir, you were, you were next, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to ask this question. Uh, but it has to do with uh, the expansion of, of nonprofits that are being supported by the, the corporate community and uh, the, the philanthropic community at large. My rudimentary knowledge of economics suggests that if market forces are at work in the corporate world, in which self-interest plays a part in support of the nonprofits, that the uh, that the amount of nonprofits that exist are meeting the need that ex that is being uh, supported in part by the corporate community. If that's the case, um, it's as much seems to me the responsibility of the corporate community, the corporate philo philanthropic community, to try to shape the, the available uh, resources and market for nonprofits as it is for the nonprofit community to consolidate its, uh, uh, its, its offerings. So can you speak something about how the corporate philanthropic community is working together to try to shape the direction and the totality of what the, the nonprofit world is, is offering? Very interesting. Uh, I just have <laughs> beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I would argue, by and large, they're not. That uh, that in an occasional community foundation, you're seeing, and so here in Boston Foundation, there's been some resources that have been attached, precisely to the question that you've addressed, because the by and large, the not-for-profit market is not an efficient market. Um, the information isn't good. The measurement isn't good. The the access to outcomes uh, by potential investors not very good. And so as a consequence, that's why you have the distortion I talked about on the front end of my presentation that Kaplan talked about in the HBR a few months ago where uh, the established large institutions continue to maintain themselves and perpetuate themselves and we have this huge noise uh, uh, in the rest of the community. Um, I have not seen, uh, a, except within the domain of an individual company's particular attention to a particular arena, any attempt on the part of the corporate community to intervene in improving the efficiency of the not-for-profit market, have you? No, and here is one of the places that we always cite as a model of at least the discussions come up, um, but it's not coordinated in that kind of way, um, and for better or for worse in, in some kinds of ways, but you know, the ease of starting a non-profit does, it's wonderful because all kinds of new ideas can awesome, but everybody's reinventing the same idea over and over again to a certain degree too, and there's no checks and balances on that. And one of the things, even in this bad economy, you would think it's so hard to raise money, everybody's suffering a drop. Well, there have been more nonprofits being created um, in part because people are saying, well, I lost my corporate job and I'm gonna do what I really wanted to do in the world anyway, and I'm gonna go follow that passion. 
um, in part because needs are growing and there are lots of places where people say, oh my goodness, nobody is taking care of this, especially as government is cutting back, so more people are coming up with these things. Um, and I'll but say, it's becoming, it's cynically though, it's or nobody, more tackle, nobody's going to tackle it in the way in which I'm going to tackle it. Um, I mean, there's a, there's, fundamental, a <laughs> there's a fundamental level of narcissism and ego associated with the creation of a new not-for-profit, and I'm going to speak quite critically about it. So I'm, you know, I'm a member of the university presidents for the Clinton Global Initiative for university students, and it's just nothing short of extraordinary. You get 1,200 uh, college students, uh, each of whom are going to save Darfur in their own individual way. Uh, and, uh, and literally what ends up happening is you have two very different points of view about what's going on there. Uh, you'll have one college president say, I look out in this group and I see all of you pursuing your own individual initiatives and your own individual passions to address issues in your own way, and I say, this is going to be a wonderful country. This is an enormous cause for optimism. Two years ago, I was at the same conference. After this college president stood down, uh, Maggie McKenna, who had up the Wall Street, uh, the, the, Wal the Walmart Foundation stands up and was a college president, and saying, I don't want to rain on your parade. But I want to suggest how much more power you could have on the issues you're trying to address if you actually knew something before you created another not-for-profit. Okay? Uh, and if you actually learned by working in one that currently existed to figure out what the opportunities are uh, to actually do something better, not just something different. So we really have that tension. You do want young people to pursue the things that gets them, get them juiced. But every once in a while, you'd like them to know something more than they currently know. <laughs> <coughs> the questioner does raise this fascinating issue, though, of what seems to be the parallel economic universe of nonprofits and the rest of the economy, where, uh, where nonprofits seem to be able to float almost magically. Uh, and and I, speaking from experience, I, I had involvement with one nonprofit that did actually dissolve itself, uh, thanks to my wonderful leadership. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it uh, it was absorbed by another nonprofit. Uh, that process is actually very arduous, uh, and so the there there's bureaucratic forces that make it harder to uh, to to consolidate as well. So it's uh, but, uh, but anyway. And as one of the cynics usually say, there aren't golden parachutes for not-for-profit executives who are excised in a merger. And the board members aren't very interested in, in eliminating themselves either. So, uh, First off, I want to say uh, bravo for bringing up that point about the extraordinary narcissism. Because uh, I ran a nonprofit. Not Babson students. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> but I ran a nonprofit and saw that with artists and saw that each person wanted to start their own nonprofit rather than ever working together. Um, my question is um, uh, as I look at this, uh, it seems that it's something of a top down approach when you're being very strategic as an organization uh, because the organization decides a very large. Uh, program that they'll have to to benefit the community and uh, philanthropically. And when I was running a nonprofit, I saw that there was many companies had what would essentially be a bottom up approach, which was giving time to their employees to work at to volunteer at the nonprofit that they chose. And I always found it hard to find those those employees. And I was curious about whether that model is disappearing, whether it worked well, um, you know, whether these are just two, two approaches that work well together or whether one is replacing the other. I, uh, a lot of companies have that idea of, you know, I'll give you time off to go volunteer and, and in part when the employment market was more robust, they had to because that's what kept better employees. People wanted to have that balance in their lives. Um, I think some of those things are being cut back more as the job market is changing. Um, but I think a lot of companies still to re retain talent, and that's a lot of the reason people have corporate philanthropy. It's not all about doing 
good for the community. It's in part about making the employees feel good about coming to work and learning new skills. I mean, you talked about some of the reasons you do it, which are you know really marvelous reasons too, and everybody gains from that. So I think there's a lot of interest in doing that, and you know the whole idea, which is very old fashioned but still continues, of matching gifts. Um, you know, a lot of companies that's what their corporate philanthropy is is to say, I'm not going to be strategic about where I give, but as an employee, you decide where you're going to give, and I'm going to match that sort of thing. Um, and as you probably heard, Apple just got a lot of attention because it's finally going to start matching gifts, which it's um, gotten a lot of attention for not being terribly philanthropic before. Hi, my name is Caitlin Hassler, and I work for the United Nations Association of Greater Boston, and. Um, our mission is to create a grassroots network of global citizens in the Boston area, and one way that we've looked at this um, kind of evolving is not just individuals as uh, part of that citizenship, but obviously corporate citizenship, and, and how can businesses um, be a part of this. And so, you know, Len, you talked about the principles for responsible management and education, um, and we are really looking at, you know, where are the, the key influencers um, for, for bringing other businesses or other um, members of the academic community or you know, the other sectors that we're talking about um, into this conversation. And so you know, as we're looking at it, we see that obviously the big influencers tend to be um, members of the business community who are leading in this field. So you know, Babson being a signatory or, or Jim's work in the community, you know, that's really how other businesses take note. Um, so what can individuals and small nonprofits um, Add and how can we be a part of that um, that push and and that partnership to influence more businesses and more corporations to be um, part of this this network of citizenship? That sounds like a Jim Crow question. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have no idea. Um, and it, to, I mean, just honestly, it sounds very. If, if somebody came to me with that, I would say. What the hell is that? And that sounds very amorphous. And you know, at, at least our approach to this is to find something really s specific and concrete where we can make a clear, you know, measurable difference. We can see businesses grow, hire people in communities like Mattapan, and that's what we want to do. And I don't know, for a little company, it's much better to do one. Thing well, than try to you know spray uh, charitable impulses uh, in a more diffuse way. No one would add. Thank you. I'm wondering um, how much, if any, research do you do um, to gauge what your what businesses do to gauge what their customers or interests um, in philanthropy is? Um, because although I like to think all businesses are just generous philanthropists, the cynic in me believes that they're doing it because they know that their customers buy a you know buy a cause, and you know Whole Foods supports the environment because they know that their customers are organically you know sensitive. So I'm just kind of curious what kind of research you do for that. Independent of the research I do, we'll talk about the research in general. Okay, so the research in general is, uh, is 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 reasonably clear. Okay, that all other things being equal, customers will express a preference for an organization that is connected to things that people care about. Now, did you hear what I said? <laughs> all other things being equal. So I used to have these marvelous conversations with Jeff Schwartz before Timberland became a corp large corporate entity. And the notion was, if you make a crappy shoe, nobody cares about all the good you do in the world, okay? <laughs> and so if you make a great shoe, all other things being equal, customers will express a preference. But rational customers, by and large, are not gonna buy on the basis of ideology or espouse corporate preference, independent of the question of what it is they're buying. Um, and, and that data is as clear as day and it's been around for a long time. Yeah, they try to be a little more happy. 
it's, um, but uh, Len's right about the data, and that'd be my experience too. I would say that um, it's a, businesses screw up every once in a while, and have, uh, you know, and, and I've had that issue. I've screwed up sometimes very publicly, and it is real helpful in those moments to have a little something in the bank with the rest of the world. That, you know, you are well thought of and people will forgive you for stumbles if they have seen you doing things that they think are good. So, and it's, you know, it's hard to quantify, but it's real, real helpful. Uh, you know, when all of a sudden you discover that your bottle supplier has been sending you bottles that have little tiny bits of glass in the bottom of them and you have to recall 25 million bottles of beer in a week. Um, it's real helpful that people think you're a, you know, a good corporate citizen that generally tries to do the right thing. And that happened to us, and uh, as near as we can tell, uh, we, ha we didn't lose any customers. <laughs> Any more questions? I think we, we are pushing close to, I don't want to stand between anyone and a Sam Adams. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to ask one final question of the panel, just a broad uh, attempt to get some forward-looking statements uh, from them about if we had this panel, if we have this panel in five years or ten years, what would what would be the theme? Where are we headed? Uh, what's uh, you've ha we've had presented for us some very interesting models. One right here in our backyard. Uh, we see what the trends are. It's getting tougher out there uh, for businesses. The importance of having some kind of Philanthropy that's aligned in a meaningful way seems to be more important than ever because if it isn't, it does go away. So, uh, is it going to? Are we going to have more or less philanthropy? I suppose corporate philanthropy uh, in the next five years or so. Are we going? Are we going into a barren period? So this is this is a like telling you whether it's going to rain tomorrow. The um, uh, I, I it is it is going to rain. Tomorrow. I, I'm a big outdoor event. I didn't want to hear that. Thank you. Um, uh, I think I think you're going to see less and less classic philanthropy. What we were talking about in the front end. You're going to see less and less money distribution in the classical way. You actually probably will find fewer people painting, um, uh, and you will find less less available time for employees to spend discretionary time on classical activities, because the vast majority of those activities will have been proven to not be strategic to the enterprises. Um, and I think you're going to find more and more examples of, uh, of enterprises with inspired forward-looking leadership like we had here today uh, that are going to figure out new and different ways to embed um, other stakeholders, including the community and people in need, uh, in the process of the building of the, and execution of the business model. Um, and, uh, and the portfolio of companies that heretofore are defined largely as uh, intentional aberrations, okay, uh, will get more and more attention, and I believe there will be more and more positive diffusion of those examples going forward. So I think we'll have plenty to talk about five years from now, but it won't be about um, just simple giving money away. Yeah, I think there is, and hopefully, well, there's a realization, I think, that's growing, and hopefully business schools can uh, amplify it, but you know they ought to tell you in business school that if you're the only person that benefits from your success, you're not going to have a lot of success. <laughs> <laughs> Last word, Stacy. I, I agree, I, and I think we're going to get very much away from the measuring in terms of dollars, um, but really looking at some of the results and the ambitions, just like Lynn talked about. I think you know, so we won't be. One of the things we do at our newspapers, you know, we list just how much people gave away, and we rank who, you know, who gave the most. And that's really, you know, it is interesting and it's good gossip, but it's probably not the way we should really be doing it. So I, I hope we'll have a discussion that's focused on, you know, who's actually solving some problems in the world. Well, panel, you were superb. 
How Thank about a big so hand much. for our speakers and our moderators? <laughs> and without further ado, beer at the Beantown Pub right now. Exit and then take a right. Thanks so much for coming tonight. And become a member if you're not already one.